Hey y'all, I think we are live. Woo woo! It's so good to see you. I see y'all jumping online already. That's fantastic. Um, boy, y'all jump on quick. That's amazing. Um, Jill is the first off the bat and I'm so excited. Uh, we are in our last lesson for overflowing abundance. Oh my goodness. How did we get here? I seem very bright. Let's, let's dim that light a little bit. Okay. How's that? Now I don't feel so bright. Um, we're in our last lesson. Of course, we log in a little early. Minnesota. Hey, Pastor Mark. Um, we are live. And so I'm going to check my Facebook over here to make sure we are live and not Memorex. I think I just dated myself. Uh, okay. I think, I think we're live, but did I do it right? Probably not. Um, it's so good to see y'all. I cannot believe we're at the end of this thing. So I did not tag myself. So I'm going to do that real quick. Go to Lutheran. So take a second to say hey to everyone and where you're from. I love seeing where y'all are from. And um, take a second before we actually start at 8 to share this on your Facebook timeline. I am getting there. I always tag myself, but for some reason it just never shows up. So I don't know what I'm doing. Um say hi to each other i see that we're live there that's fantastic so i'm going to share this live i was scrolling past the video where i was um, sideways which is so special okay share i don't have my glasses on so share is it letting me share to me oh because i'm on there <laughs> Okay, share to me. So I'm going to share it to my timeline. Okay, I'm so sorry. Y'all, say hi to each other. I see you. Vegas in the house again. Carol in the house. Canada in the house again. I love it. Um, let me share this real quick. I see, I see a lot of y'all are sharing. That's fantastic. That's great. Uh, share now public. Okay, uh, so I should be shared now. This has been shared to your timeline. Don't you love social media? It has been such a godsend during this time, hasn't it? Because it has really worked to keep us connected. And so we have like a minute. So grab your beverage. I've got Coke Zero again from this wonderful mug that Michigan Youpers sent me. So if you're from Michigan, you probably recognize the, the whole Youper thing going on there. So thank you, sweet friends, a minute. And uh, I said Minnesota. It's Michigan, isn't it? I'm going to get myself in trouble. You think I wasn't educated. Um, I'm so glad y'all are here. It's, it's amazing. I see we have almost 300 people online in less than four minutes, which is fantastic. I have so loved this time with y'all. And so stay tuned at the end because there's a special announcement on what's coming next. So you don't want to miss that. So I think we are straight up eight o'clock. So you know what? I'm all about keeping us on time because we have so much to dig into tonight as we wrap up. So I'm going to start us in prayer, if you would pray with me. Father, what an amazing, amazing day you've given us. And it was amazing simply because you let it happen. You, you gave us the air we needed, the breath we needed, everything we needed for today. Overflowing abundance, whether that day had challenges or whether today was... Um, just a day of rest. Father, we know that you were there all the way. So Father, as we dig into your word uh, for this last session of overflowing abundance, I pray that you just let your spirit move, move it online because you can move anywhere. And so Father, we know that you can move online in hearts and souls. And Father, we just pray that you do that for everyone connected now, everyone who will connect in the future. Father, just give them what they need to know that you are enough and give um, the words from scripture that they need to hear that you are there for them, that you are their savior. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So as we start, say hi to President Debbie Larson, who is live in the comments. Say hi to President uh, Debbie, say hi to Vice President Susan Brunkow, and say hi to Pastoral Counselors Mitch and Brian. And so it's so wonderful to have y'all here. So, if you are on your study guide, we're on page 88 in the study guide. Page 88 in the study guide. And I'm, I've remembered again to be able to give y'all the, is my volume up? To be able to give y'all the blanks for each one. And so I'll make sure to do that. But this is our last lesson. But hang on, there's an announcement at the end. So we left off last week with, with, 
Jesus having the disciples seating the crowd and the actual miracle finally taking place and how all that went down of seating the people by garden bed by garden bed. You know, we remember that phrase and establishing order so that the disciples could feed the crowd. So we left off with Jesus actually performing that multiplication miracle. And it was bread full to their satisfaction, fish and loaves to their satisfaction, which is amazing. And we may think heading into this last lesson that, okay, the meal is over, that means the story's over. But you know what? The day is not over yet. And there is still some stuff happening. So if you would turn with me to Matthew 14, that should be dog-eared and ugly in your Bible by now. Matthew 14. Matthew 14, we're going to look at verse 20 and 21. Verses 20 and 21, Matthew 14. It says, And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. Now, this kind of seems like an anticlimactic ending, because if you remember the scene, you know, they, they've been there, they've, they're in their garden bed by garden bed, they've, they've eaten, the sun is setting, the people have been healed, they've heard about this kingdom that, that is beyond the grave, this hope beyond the grave, and you get this sense that people are just, you know, relaxing. And it's interesting that um, after all of that, Jesus is concerned about the trash pickup. You know, it's like anticlimactic. It's like all this, you always want to end on the high note, like end on the feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 20,000, and he did it, rah, and we go. But he says, no, no, pick up what's left over. Pick up what's left over. And why would he end with that? Because what we see here is the full circle of discipleship. We see the full circle of discipleship. Because if you realize, the first thing Jesus asked them was, um, the disciples to ask the people to have a seat. He, he, he asked the disciples for a little setup, you know, for thinking in potluck terms, you know. He asked for the disciples to, for a little setup. Get the people situated, create some aisles, you know, let's get the baskets, let's get, you know, let's get some order, and then we can serve. And so the kind of the first step was Jesus asking for the setup. And the second step we see is them actually feeding the people. And, I mean... What an amazing time that would have been for the people. Because when you, when you serve a meal, if you've done that at a potluck, and you probably have, or even at another meal, it takes time to serve a meal. Because you don't just throw the food at people. You know, you, um, you take time to, to maybe chat or smile or say, here, how are you doing or whatever. So you get this relaxed sense of the fact that they took time, you know, serving. And then at the end, Jesus says, don't forget, you know, we got to clean up. But it wasn't just a full circle of discipleship, which is necessary. He also didn't want any of his provision to go to waste, any of it. Because we see in John's gospel of the feeding of the 5,000 that Jesus said, uh, pick up the pieces so that nothing may be lost, so that nothing may be lost. And what we see there is God gives us what we need, but he also overflows so we can share that with others. We can have stuff for a little later. It's not like the Old Testament manna where it went bad after a day. Sometimes he provides blessing in our life that overflows for a long time, especially if he's blessed you financially, if he's blessed you with um, a place that people can retreat to. I have dear friends in my uh, connect group who, for years, they had a house in, in Fredericksburg in the Hill Country in Texas, and anybody in ministry was welcome to take a break and go up there for weekends or week longs and I can't tell you that the number of times that I was able to stay up there in Fredericksburg 20 miles outside of nowhere with nothing but coyotes you know and 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 things but it was so peaceful and that overflowing abundance that allowed them to get that house at that time was a blessing to others for people in ministry just to unplug and just to relax but I kind of see this post-event cleanup as like a ministry event follow-up I mean, think about Christmas services. Think about um, Easter services. You know, when we have a lot of visitors in our churches, there's follow-up that needs to happen afterwards. You know, whether it's um, 
texting somebody, making a phone call, dropping by their house. It's that follow-up that matters, that personal touch that matters. And I'll never forget, you know, when I when I first became a Christian, I first walked into the in through the doors at Salem Lutheran Church. I was scared stiff because I just knew everybody would see how bad I was, you know, uh, because I didn't have the concept then that, you know, the the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You know, we, we've all sinned and we all have the same grace. And when I first walked into that church, I wouldn't have walked in had the person who invited me not been walking with me. And so that was a ministry follow-up. And after that, each time we would meet at Salem, he, I was never walking through the doors by myself. Uh, they always met me at the door to make sure that I was felt safe and comfortable and welcomed. And it's a ministry follow-up. And so as the people here are realizing what has happened and kind of getting stirring around to kind of move, um, the disciples are picking up the pieces and picking up the pieces. And we may not see cleanup as necessary um, or important, but, it's, it, but it is. It is very necessary. I'll never forget rafting down the Grand Canyon. I did that about a decade ago. And if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it. It's amazing. But it was always amazing to me that when we would, uh, we rafted for three days straight and we rafted, it was like 125 miles in three days because that Colorado River just goes. And every time we docked into a place to camp overnight, it looked like no one had ever been there. Like we were the first explorers because they were very intentional in Grand Canyon National Park that anyone, anyone who is um, in the park, if they make any kind of fire, trash, whatever, everything has to be removed. And it it's such a picture of taking care of what God has given us. And we see that here, that it's a full circle step. It's part of that full circle of ministry. And it's probably the hardest step. And the reason I say that is because I know a lot of you on here who um, do potlucks, because that's, I mean, purple women, that's just what we do. We do potlucks, we serve funeral meals, we do all kind of stuff. But the cleanup, even though it's not our favorite task, it's a necessary, it's a very necessary task because it's that full circle. And it's the hardest task because by then we're exhausted. And you got to remember in the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples were already exhausted. Remember, they were, they were getting away withdrawing with Jesus to get some rest and they get in a boat and dock and here's all these people and they don't get rest. So by the time they've already landed, not rest, Ed, not rested, and have served all day, now Jesus says, don't forget to clean up. I, I you know, I wonder if any of the disciples like roll their eyes like, oh, like I just want a nap because I know I felt that way. But the cleanup is important but it's also the most exhausting because all you want to do when everything is done and everything is over is you just want to go home and go to sleep and get off your feet. And I, I see a lot of women going, yep, 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 because that's true. But it says there were 12 baskets of leftover broken pieces. Did you realize that what was left over was more than the original amount? What was left over was even more abundant than the original five loaves. And that's part of the miracle. And when you look at the original language, when we're talking about 12 baskets of what was left over, we're not talking about, you know, half-eaten pieces of bread or, or pieces of crust, because that's, that's just gross. It, it more refers to untouched portions of bread. Now, I have always been kind of a germaphobe, and maybe that's because it's, you know, growing up in a big family. But um, I have always not eaten after anyone or let anyone drink out of my cup. I don't care who they are. And it's so funny because over the years, my sisters know, my sisters know that if uh, they don't want to go to the kitchen to get a drink, all they have to do is drink out of mine because if they drink out of my cup, it's theirs. Like, that's it. And I wonder how many of us following this coronavirus have become germaphobes and I don't think that's a bad thing I, I, I really don't but when, when it said broken pieces my germaphobe flag went up but it's more of untouched portions untouched portions so we're not talking pieces that have been slimed on and stuff like that but um, 
these baskets, let's, let's talk about these baskets. Because I know in one of the earlier lessons, there was a question about where did the baskets come from? Well, you know, you're in a fishing area, and so there were tons of baskets, you know, for, for different kind of stuff. But these particular baskets, you know, back then, they made them with reeds and, and twigs and natural materials and stuff. And they were, you know, small, medium, and large. But in the New Testament, there were really two main kinds of baskets. There were ones that were really, really big, like used for harvest time, like used to store the fish uh, from the fishermen. Like they were big enough where you could actually fit a person in them. They would usually have handles with a lid. And the big baskets that you could literally like sit in and hide um, were carried with poles. But that's not the baskets that we're talking about here because they had the large baskets and the small baskets for like household items. But this word for basket here is only used in the New Testament four times and it's only used in the context of the feeding of the 5,000. So this word for basket only appears in the four accounts of the feeding of the 5,000. And this basket means it held individual portions. It was almost like a, an old school lunchbox, but it was a basket that you could like hang on your, on your belt or the, or the rope that, that held your robe. And so it's a specific kind of basket. And it's like Jesus didn't want the disciples to miss the blessing that was left over because you can't really forget something when it's strapped to you, right? When you get hungry and all you have to do is go right there, you know, the disciples were remembered every time if they pulled out of that pouch what that pouch used to hold. And that's so, so powerful. But there were 12 baskets left over, and that's not a mistake. 12 is a very important number in Scripture. We see it in the Old Testament. 12 was representative of, of Jacob's sons, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And in the New Testament, it represented, you know, God's people, the church, through the 12 apostles. So there were 12 baskets. But with those 12 baskets that the disciples had, he didn't have to remind the disciples that they had failed. He gave them a tangible reminder that he's always going to be enough. He didn't, you, you don't see him pulling the disciples aside saying, you know, you doubted, I told you so. You don't see that. You see him giving again, giving provision again. Here's a basket. Here is the provision you need for, for lunch today or dinner tonight or breakfast tomorrow, whatever it is. And it's on you. He didn't doubt to shame. He reminded out of love. And that's one of the most beautiful things out of this whole story. But you'll see it on your notes page. With the baskets, Jesus provided a reminder that he is always enough. With the baskets, Jesus provided a reminder that he is always enough. You know, during this pandemic, I think we've doubted that he's enough. I, I know that I have. When And I'm not just talking toilet paper and stuff like that. But are we going to survive? Are we going to get through this? How is it going to affect my family? Am I going to lose my job? There are many ways we can doubt when things aren't going well. And remember in the crowd, you had people who were sick. You had the disciples who were exhausted. You're not talking stellar people who were there for a party. You know, these were needs being met. And I think this pandemic has reminded us that we doubt, but we have a God who always provides enough. But did you notice with the 12 baskets that there wasn't one for Jesus? There wasn't one for Jesus which allowed the disciples the opportunity to share back with Jesus what he had provided for in the first place. That's such a literal picture of offerings and tidings. We have what we have in this life because God gave first, period. Everything we have, our homes, our cars, our blessings, whatever it is, our family, everything we have, everything we have is because he gave it first. And so we give back, we give back. So how are we doing that during this time? When we're, when we're doubting maybe and, and backtracking a little or being, being hesitant to, to spend or hesitant to get out, whether you're wearing a mask or not, you know, how are we doubting? Um, but Jesus, Jesus with just giving 12 baskets reminded the disciples that, yeah, share back th with what you've been overflown with, overflowing with, to share back with others. Because a lot of times when we have so much, and we talked about this in an earlier lesson, we have so much blessing 
that it flows through us. It's not supposed to stick with us, you know, even though some of it does. But the leftovers, I found this interesting, the leftovers shared pointed people to the provider. When, if the disciples shared what they had later, if we share what we have now, and we tell them the blessing from whom it came, we have an opportunity to provide out of that overflowing abundance a way for people to see Jesus. Yeah, I only have two rolls of toilet paper, but here's one. Here's one of my two. I know that's a sad example, but it's just so relevant for right now. But what is he overflowing right now that if you're holding on to, maybe maybe open your fist and, and, and decide to, to give instead. You know, we, we have that. Give back to God what was his in the first place. But we remember that when we give to God, we just don't give him our leftovers. Um, I know way back when I was horrible with finances, when I was in my 20s, I got into horrible debt. Y'all have heard that story. Um, but I would always uh, pay bills first, pay bills first, and there was nothing left to do anything with. And if I had money left over, that's where that $5 would come from to give at church. God got my leftovers. But, and this is in your outline, this is in your book, in response to what God has done, we offer him our first fruits and our leftovers. What he gave to us, we give him back the top 10% right off the top. No questions asked. And I realize that that, that may not be something that, that some, of, some of us can do. And I, I get that. I've, I've been there. I've been there. But he gets our first fruits, not just our leftovers. You know, and the people can get the leftovers, but God needs to also get our first fruits and then let the leftovers flow through us to other people. He gets both because he provided both, which is just a very cool thing. And the account of the feeding of the 5,000 ends with account of the people. You know, it says there were 5,000 men, you know, besides women and children. It, excuse me, and it wasn't rude. That was just the culture of of the day, how they counted people. Kind of like today when the census says, you know, every family has 2.5 kids. Well, it's not like your kid is worth 0.5. You know, your kid is not less than. That's just the way our culture counts it today. Then they just counted men because women often sat and ate separately from the men because a lot of times the men would talk business and stuff and, and they, you know, it was just culturally unacceptable for the the kid for the wives and the kids to be around. But as we reach the end of Matthew's account on the feeding of the 5,000, there's a, there's a glaring group of people who are silent and it's the crowd. It's the crowd. We've, we've gotten through all this. They've received blessing. They've received food until they've been satisfied. And yet in Matthew's account, we see that they're completely silent. So here we go to John's account to finish our story, to finish the rest of the story. So flip with me to John 6. John 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 6. John 6. And let's look at verses 14 and 15. Let's look at verses 14 and 15. John 6 verses 14 and 15. It says, when the people saw the sign that he had done, the huge miracle that he had done, because we're talking, these were local people. They, looking around at all the people there, the local people finally got it. Like, okay, this really was a miracle because there's no way we had this much provision in any way, shape, or form. And so the crowd finally gets it. And they're like, okay, this was really huge. So verse 14, it says, When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to a mountain by himself. I love the book of John. I don't know about y'all, but I love the book of John because I think John would have been a great news reporter. You know, you have the synoptic gospels that kind of uh, are toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other, but then you have John's gospel. And John's gospel is very good because, you know, he was the the disciple that lived the longest. You know, he was the only one to die a natural death. And his, his gospel was written decades after the others. And so John had the opportunity to see what had been written and maybe fill in some gaps that he thought were, was important to include through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 
And so John fills in the gap that the people were actually wowed, wowed. And we talked about that last lesson. When's the last time you were awed by something God did in your life that was so much and such a blessing that it could not have been any way else other than from God? When's the last time you were wowed by that? Maybe it's been during this pandemic. You know, a lot of a lot of people, um, it's interesting how different people react to um, pressure or, or stress or uh, having their plans altered. And for a lot of people, this, this being on lockdown has been a very hard time. And I can certainly understand that. I've got a friend of mine who has five kids and they're all home. I can so understand that. But for me, this has been very much a time of refreshing. And I'm almost hesitant to say that because there are so many people that are like, refreshing, what do you, and they just like go off on a tangent. And I'm like, okay, I'm just telling you like how it's been for me. But it's been refreshing. It's allowed me to, to slow down my pace of life, to get more deeply in the word again, to reassess what's important and what's not. And if that's been you, don't be afraid to say that, you know. Yes, it's been very stressful. There have been huge losses, catastrophic, 100K people. We can't, we can't negate that. We can't, uh, you know, ignore that. But if this season has been some kind of a blessing, be brave and share that too. Because there, like we talked about last time, there's blessing in every season. You know, the blessing always follows the brokenness. And don't be afraid to say that any more than to be afraid to say, this has been the hardest time in my life. And that's okay to say too, because you know what? In both situations, Jesus was there. Jesus was there. And it's okay. And it's okay. So we see this um, happening here that Jesus is, at the end of John 6, 15, we see that Jesus is once again withdrawing. And I find it interesting that the narrative ends how it began. Remember when Jesus was withdrawing, he was withdrawing with the disciples. They had just got back from their first missionary journey. Um, Jesus wanted to stay under Herod's radar. And they were all very saddened by the beheading of uh, John the Baptist. And so they were withdrawing. And I find it interesting that after all of this uh, time of, of the day of the feeding of the 5,000 stuff, that we find Jesus again withdrawing. But he's withdrawing for a different reason. The first time he was withdrawing to get away to be refreshed. This time he's withdrawing because what was happening was the people um, d still didn't understand. The, the people still kind of saw him as uh, a road trip chef. They're like, hey, this guy can make food come out of his hands. We're following that guy anywhere. They didn't get it that Jesus wasn't a road trip chef. He's the rescuer of our soul. And Jesus knew that his, his mission here was not to be an earthly king. And so when the people went to, it says, to try to take him by force to make him a king, Jesus knew that was not the Father's will, and so he withdrew. And it gives us permission again when we see that in our own lives to withdraw. When we see that, that what is happening is not what we know that God has called us to do or wants us to do or allows us to do in some way, shape, or form, that it's okay to withdraw and not be a part of that, whatever that may look like. But Jesus sees through the crowd. He says, I'm not here to be a king, and he withdraws. And so let's look at John 6, 26 and 27. 26 and 27. Because by then Jesus has withdrawn, and he's, he's going away. Verse 26 says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In other words, that's where Jesus is saying, dude, I am not your road trip chef, you know. Verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Jesus calls him out. He challenges them. He, the people are following him and he's like, wait a second, time out. Listen to what I'm saying. And he challenges them. He said, you know, I'm not this. I'm this. And when he gets their attention finally and kind of stops them in their tracks with the, look, that's, that's not what I'm here for, then he tells them actually who he really is. Look at verse 35. Verse 35, it says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, 
and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He tells him who he is. He tells him that even though you can't see it now, I'm the bread that you need for eternity. It's not a bread of the stomach. I'm the God of eternity. So he sees through it. He calls him out and he says, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Do you think the disciples ever ate those leftovers in the baskets on their pouch without those words ringing in their head? As they're eating those leftovers, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. On your outline, ordinary bread supports physical life, but Jesus is the bread that gives eternal life. Ordinary bread supports physical life, but Jesus is the bread that gives eternal life. <laughs> Can you believe we're at 30 minutes? But we're going to close because we have been on a ride. We have been on a ride with this study. We learned in lesson one that taking the lead from Jesus that when life hits us hard, when life blindsides us, it's okay to withdraw. It's okay to withdraw to rest. We learned in lesson two that even when we're suffering, he's enough. He's enough. Even when our agendas are altered and life is not going or the day is not going like we thought it needed to, he's enough. And his plan is still perfect. His plan is still perfect. We may feel like the disciples when they finally brainstormed all day and said, you know, all we got is five loaves and two fish. You know, here you go. We may feel like those disciples sometimes that our offering to Jesus is meager. But they gave it all. They gave all that they had. We give all that we have. Because, once again, he gave it to us first. And when we can't see the numbers adding up, you know, they had five loaves and two fish, but disciples always count to eight. We cannot forget Jesus in the equation. We may have what we think is not enough, but when we add Jesus in that equation, it's always enough. So, fellow disciples, count to eight. Every single time, count to eight. And remember, just like we talked about last time, that seasons of brokenness are followed by seasons of blessing. This may be a, a, a terrible season of brokenness for you, a terrible season of brokenness for the world uh, over the losses. Um, but there's a season of blessing coming. I can already see glimpses of the good that's come out of this, and I bet that you have too. But in every single situation, He is the bread of life. He is our bread of life. He is overflowing, abundant in our life, and he's enough. He's enough. So when you go forth with this pandemic going on, we're slowly coming out of it. People are starting to get together again. Don't let the sorrow rob you of the joy. Don't, don't do it. Don't sit back and hold back and wait for the other shoe to drop. Engage. Offer all you have, whatever that looks like, and know that he is enough. And what may not look like enough to you, he will multiply and multiply and multiply. Y'all, I have so enjoyed. I have so enjoyed this time with y'all. We've got 450 people online, and I just love it. Um, I've enjoyed this time in the Word with y'all. And um, I want to pray us out, and then I'm going to make a couple of, of announcements. So let's pray. Um, Father, in a season where... It's been kind of scary. Um, we have seen that you're enough, that you have gotten us through each day, that you have gotten us through uh, something some days we may think we could not have gotten through. But Father, thank you for this study. In the middle of withdrawing and in the middle of maybe hoarding to a certain extent, you remind us that you're a God of overflowing abundance, that we can open our fist and we can share what you've already given us and even if it feels like leftovers, they came from you. And so we share them, trusting you to provide, trusting you in every step of the way. And so, Father, for every single person who has gone through this study, I pray that your words ruminate in their heart, in their soul, in their mind. I pray that you've, you've changed them through this study, Father, that you've, that you've taught them something that is lasting, long-lasting, that has changed perception or perspective and drawn them closer to you. So Father, I pray that for every single person for this study. And Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for grace. Thank you for love. And thank you for forgiveness. And thank you for the power and, and truth and the inerrant word that you have given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So the announcements, um, we are going to do another online Bible study. Yes, we are. We are trying to figure out what that's going to look like. It'll be very similar to this. We're just trying to kind of figure out which study to do. Uh, so if you have a suggestion, maybe put that in the comments. Um, but we are going to do another online study because there are so many people who have been connected with this and have loved this that, that we see that that need needs to be met. And so the whole LWML Executive Committee and I, uh, we're, we're going to jump on board with this again. And we don't know when, but know that it's coming. Know that it's coming. But in the meantime, if you're if you're missing getting together, you know, the LWML has a podcast. And um, Becca has started a podcast uh, that you'll find on the LWML website. I think she's only on like lesson two of this. Um, and what is it called? I don't have that in front of me. I'm so literally blonde. Why don't I have that in front of me? Because I just don't. Um, but if you go to the LWML website, um, you'll see that she has a podcast. I'm looking it up as we speak. I'm so wrong. Uh, Becca's podcast, yes, it is called, if, uh, some of you are probably listening, The Task-Filled Life. The Task-Filled Life. It's a Bible study on hope. A Bible study on hope. And that's going on right now uh, on a podcast on the LWML website that Becca is leading. And so jump into that. And in the meantime, we're going to get our ducks in a row and figure out what study's coming next. And you will be the first to know. Thank you so much for loving the Word so much, for loving Jesus so much, for your passion for the Word, for your passion for LWML. Thank you so much for all of that because it's all to God's glory and for His good and for our growing in faith. And so God bless you. I want to hear your prayer request. Um, Debbie Larson is in the comments and um, you know our pastoral counselors and our Christian Life Vice President, Susan. We're all in the comments. As soon as I go off live, I'm hitting the comments. And uh, we want to hear your prayer request. We want to hear um, what has been the blessing of this study so it can inform our decisions for what comes next. We want to hear from you and we want to pray with you. And so thank you so much for this. I love you. I love you. I love you. And we will talk soon. God bless you.